Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second panel of our online Liberty Falcon. Uh, this panel is DMing, GMing tips for playing tabletop RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons. I'm Mr. Keller, the Strategy Games Club advisor. We've got some students here to ask some questions, and we've got expert panelists. Um, <laughs> Christopher Haggerty, um, Anthony Cafiero, and Teos Abadia. So I guess, because I just said your name in that order, how about you all uh, introduce yourselves and give a brief blurb um, before we move on to the next person. So go ahead and start us off, Chris. Um, I laugh because I'm really not a professional at all. Like the, the other people here are much more pro than I am. I am an artist and a teacher, uh, originally from the Oregon area, metro area. Um, my advanced degrees in education and or art draft, uh, drawing and painting. Uh, and I'm just a long time tabletop game player since I was a wee little kid. And it's, um, as I was kind of explaining in the panel before, it's kind of the hobby or the pursuit that I had when I was young. And I've jettisoned all the other worldly delights along the way. And uh, like, you know, being a parent, being a teacher, being a money earner, and then also I play games. And so that's about the, the summation of my life right now. So, um, mm -hmm. and that is it. And like, you know, I draw paint and I like to do crafty and arty things around game stuff. So that's my shtick. Thanks, Chris. Anthony? I'm Anthony Cafiero. I'm originally from New York State, uh, but I've been in Portland um, cooking uh, as a professional chef for the last 20 years. Um, and uh, gaming has always been part of my life. But now uh, I also, a few years ago, I started a Dungeons and Dragons supper club, essentially, called Orcs, Orcs, Orcs pop-up tavern. Uh, we take over a bar or restaurant once or twice a month, and we hold games for up to 45 people. Eight tables of five or six people, pro, pro DMs running uh, four-hour one-shots. You get dinner, dessert, and a whole game of Dungeons & Dragons for $45. Age groups, your guys' level, are totally cool, by the way. You can do that. And um, yeah, so Orc Store Source is uh, what we do. We also publish adventures. And I happen to be running uh, a few games now. Uh, I play a lot more D&D &D than I used to, to be honest, uh, with online stuff. Um, uh, being a DM is not my main focus. I'd rather be a player and a creator. I love drawing maps, making maps, and uh, painting minis as well, art major kind of style. But I'm getting into it a little bit more. It's, a, it's, it's been an interesting little journey the last, the last few months, for sure. Yeah, but uh, yeah, check out Orcs, 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 you guys. It's pretty fun. Oh, thanks, Anthony. And Teos, you're up. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Teos Abadia, and I am a creator. Uh, I design uh, games of various sorts, uh, primarily tabletop role-playing games and primarily Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, probably the best thing I've done is this little fun thing here, the Acquisitions Incorporated book. I was able to... <laughs> I was able to contribute to that, which was a dream come true. And certainly when I was in middle school and high school, never would have imagined that my dungeon mastering efforts would have led to that. But one of the awesome things about dungeon mastering is that it lets you start creating and exercising your creative muscles. And over time, you can turn it into whatever you want, including eventually actually publishing your own material. And maybe it could even be to that level. Who knows? But, but it's a, a ton of fun along the way. That's super cool. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, do any students have questions to start us off or should I get us into gear? Just pop a question mark if you have a question right away. Otherwise, I will ask the first question. All right, Josh, go ahead. Hey, so I'm looking to make encounters for my party. I'm looking to have multiple monsters uh, combining their efforts to defeat the party in an ambush-like setting or otherwise, but I'm mm -hmm. not sure how to get that to work without it just looking like you could, each of the monsters attacking on their own terms. So is the question uh, uh, how to use minions uh, in, in like a fun way or uh, in, are you talking, you're talking online gaming, right, Joshua? Uh, in person. Oh, in per yeah, uh, okay, cool. Huh. So I've got a possible take on this. Um, yeah. There's something I was blogging about <laughs> recently is the idea of trying to create something engaging in your encounters 
uh, engaging for the players. So I, I like to treat, when I design, I like to treat things like it's a movie set. Mm -hmm. And I look at it from the perspective of the movie that's being filmed. And I think, all right, you know, here I am. I'm, I'm these six individuals. I walk in the cameras from their perspective. What's in the room and why do I want to deal with it? And so you're talking about the monsters and the monsters is another cool perspective. Uh, they're on the other side, wherever they are around this room, forest, cave, whatever it is. But they're doing something together that is going to affect us. And so that's where I would start. I would look at it from that perspective and start scheming. So one of the things I might think is uh, there's a bridge that they need to cross and they're taking it apart. So they're working together to take it apart. And I could cook up some rules for how they are going to do that, at what rate, maybe skill checks, fun things like that, and how the other side is going to stop it. Or maybe they're going to topple a huge pillar. Or here's a great one. You walk in, there are a bunch of kobolds in the room. They've got this huge trap that they're trying to fix. They've got their gear toolkit out. And you are clearly, the, the characters are all standing on a huge pressure plate. <laughs> <laughs> so those kinds of scenarios, right? Obvious, and, and you, really you can be as obvious as you want with players, unless it's supposed to be mystery, be obvious. So it's like, if they put together that machine, the char characters are gonna be in trouble, go, right? That kind of thing. So Chase, you're doing a, a timer countdown, and that's actually what I was gonna suggest as well. Yeah. A, there's a, there's a, it's fun using a timer, and it doesn't have to be like rounds. You could simply take, you know, a five minute uh, egg timer, you know, a little hourglass, and be like, and then this is what happens. So it makes it more realistic when your party, when your players are like, uh, we can take half an hour to discuss this. Now you guys got five minutes to figure out how you're going to get in while a bunch of Durgar are having dinner in the room. You you can hear them eating dinner. They're chatting, <laughs> you know, but like I, a, a, a countdown is a great way to like really push that, that minion thing and get them to work together. Like create, like they have their own little lives too. I love what, yeah, like they've got mm -hmm. their own little dialogue going on too. That's cool. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Do we have another question from the audience? Well, one question I have, I think, um, is it's it's really difficult sometimes as a DM to know what what to do to make it fun for players. And so do you have any tips on how to kind of gauge or figure out what your play group wants from you as a DM? I have an idea about that. Um, there's a lot of like things that aren't totally written out, like in most of the play guides and whatnot, but usually like the simplest route to figuring that out is usually the easiest. So I would totally say like, what would be fun for you? Like before the campaign start or the venture, or, like, you know, even on an ongoing basis, it's totally cool to step outside the story and say, Hey, what, what do you think would be fun? And then the players is like, oh, I really want to be involved in this. I really want to be in an intense tactical battle, or I really want like you know this story to happen. I want to explore my backstory, and it's kind of like the game master slash DM's like role to kind of juggle the different imperatives of the people that they're regularly playing with and try and like you know figure out what the fun. And and then the DM and GM has to have a fun too. So as a DM, it's okay to tell the players, like, it'd be really fun for me to run a game like this and like have this back and forth. So I think particularly think about youthful clubs and where like, you know, signals cross in the most like big flame out ways that are just hilarious to see as a teacher. And like, you know, the fights that kind of break out, like, you know, TPKs that happen. It's like, well, why did that happen? It like, um, it's okay to communicate, to step outside your player and just like, hey, wait, this would be fun to do this and negotiate that. So, sorry, I kind of blab for a bit, but I think no, like, being, right. being, being oblivious and being like really direct and being able to step in and out of that at certain periods of time and just flag, I think people have called it flagging where the fun is, I think is kind of pretty important to have make sure everyone's like on the same page about stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I got someone on that because uh, it kind of goes back to what Chris was saying in our last panel about um, uh, having like an offline, sorry, an out of person but online chat between sessions. The use of uh, a session zero I'm finding in life is very important because if me as DM will have a cool game idea and I've got my friends and they want to do totally not that, then I need to know about that before we start so they have a kick-ass time. And like really involving them 
uh, off, like, you know, out of session, but online, we have, like I said before, we have a whole Slack channel where you can chat to each other and the Game Master in character between sessions. And it's really fun because then the, the DM can prepare the right thing for the next session and kind of get, like, gain the consensus on his group so that everyone's happy. And that's fun. Can you can yeah. you speak a little bit about what you mean by session zero, just in case other people in the room don't know? Sure, I, I can. But Teos, if, do you have an opinion on ses session zero? Yeah, I can, I can. I can try yeah. to weave these together. It's it's a great idea. You're you're spot on. So session zero is the idea that before you have your first actual gaming session, where you all roll dice and start the adventure, you know, meet in the tavern, whatever it is that happens, um, you're going to sit down as a group and say, "Hey, what do we want out of this?" And it, it starts really tying into what Chris was saying, where you as DM also get your fun, right? So when I did my last big campaign, I was running a published adventure, but I wanted to put my own spit on it. So I said, okay, I'm going to rub Tomb of Annihilation, which is this published fifth edition D&D adventure. Um, you know, but there are a number of toggles that we could use, like how much do we all want to be in tombs? Or when we're going through the jungle, you know, like, like, do you want a super Indiana Jones this thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and they were like, yes, we want super tombs, traps, you know, <laughs> give us the Indiana Jones. I'm like, great, because I love that. So there's going to be some amount of that, but now I could really go whole hog because I knew that they were into it. On the other hand, one of the things is in this adventure, you move around the jungle a lot. And so I was like, to what extent do you want to be worried about running out of water, out of food? Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to feel like it's, you know, tough to get through and they're like nope we do not want to do that realism bit like we want to have cool encounters but we don't want to suffer through this and you know be exhausted or anything like that and so that's the kind of thing you can do and, and not just in your session zero though that is the most important part to get it started uh but periodically i would send my group polls online i would use you know google forms or something and say hey what are you liking? Like, I want more role playing, or I want more exploration, or I want more combat, or you know, anything else. And so, like, they really like playing with miniatures. This was an in-person game, so they would say, you know, keep the minis coming. So that kind of thing gave me feedback to to touch on what individuals wanted. But the nice thing about polls is uh, you get the aggregate view when it's summed up, but you also get to see what the individuals want. So if you know that one person really needs a particular style, you can get to that because there are different types of players. So. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> I think, um, and feel free, students, to type a question mark anytime you think of a question. Um, but I guess a follow-up question after session session zero, or maybe even before session zero, you've got to have either a module you're working from, or your own homebrew plot narrative that you've you've drummed up. What what do you do to make a a good central conflict or a, or a dynamic engaging villain or i guess if you're doing the opposite of uh like a hex crawl like how do you manage not having a central conflict or central villain i like movies uh so sometimes i'll get pretty inspired by things and be like ah I love this scene. Like, this is such a cool thing. The way I, I have always done this is I will take a published module and I'll cut it up and I'll, and I'll, I'll slip in a ton of homebrew between things. I like how they write. I don't need to design a dungeon. I can remove things. I can add things in. If there's nice assets like um, cool magic items and things like that, I don't really love coming up with my own or like searching through them, like whatever's written is cool. Someone spent a lot of time, I've written two two adventures. It's a lot of work, so I respect that. Mm -hmm. But I like getting like some of the cheaper, like the Goodman Games modules, they're like 15 bucks and they're kind of old school D&D. &D. I like that, there's maybe two, three maps in there, some cool characters and I'll take that and I'll stick it in my home, I'll, 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 I'll put it in my homebrew world and I'll work it in. I'll change names and I'll change things, but I, but like this dungeon's cool. So I do a lot of like piecemealing of my items that I have at, and there's a lot out there now, guys, with internet and free stuff on Reddit. It's a lot of cool stuff. The other thing I'll do sometimes is grab the coolest map I can find and be like, I'm gonna design around this. Hmm. So, so it's it's a piecemeal thing. If I'm doing homebrew, that's one thing. I've never run a, a published adventure word for word straight through. I don't think anyone ever has. <laughs> I think um, 
I played a lot of like old schooler, like hexy crawly type of like generative type play. The big word generative meaning um, the game kind of like like the next session just like follows on from what happens before. And so having like the plot, the narrative and what the players want to do kind of like follow on about the things that like just came up and play the last session. So like, say like have a random run in with like, you know, random table of like, so a band of orcs or whatnot, and then they let the orcs go or like they beat up all the orcs. And then like, then they figure out like why the orcs were there in the first place. So you kind of go from, random occurrences that are generated so that's not really high brown brain power and then for the next session you just kind of generate all the reasons why that happened after the fact mm -hmm. and so generally they're popped in like you know you can throw in like a pre-made something say you just want to have a dungeon with like skeletons in the tomb and then you make that and maybe that's somewhere off in the foothills that they can hit but like about half of the stuff you should probably be looking for like what really drives or like grinds the gears of the players like you know ooh, if a player says oh i really hate that guy then you should have that guy show up and be hateable like mm -hmm. an ongoing basis so i think like um Utilizing that story stuff that just kind of pops up as you play organically is a really good resource. And that way, as like, you know, the game master, dungeon master, you don't have to sweat like making that gigantic, like, you know, novel with maps and all this crap that like we'll just you'll be obsessing over. So utilize resources of your players and recognize that playing the game is half the players and the people like saying what they like, what they don't like, and just kind of riffing off of it. So get into that improv sentimentality and then the writing and the sensibility is easier it just takes a while to like get to that point where it's kind of surfing along i love that Chris. one of the things i was i'll pop on the edge of that because it's perfect is don't do too much prep because it's not just your game uh, <laughs> yes. And like the teenage, Flurry, the teenage sin, the teenage yeah, like, sin, like the the lazy lazy dungeon master Sly Flourish, like like there's books on how to just let them make their story, and all you're doing is refereeing. Like take even yeah. more step back. Um, although at the same time, Teo's just added to Ak Inc's you know <laughs> book, so I don't know how you feel about like that. But uh, well, that's yeah, that's, that's my game. tug of war. My yeah. tug of war, yeah. my whole life has been the following and it really happened when i was a, a young dungeon master this kind of aha moment where the players said to me and this was i was in south america growing up uh running my my group and and they said let's play tonight and i said oh i don't have anything prepared they're like yeah make something up i'm like uh i always <laughs> over prepare you know everything needs like five books worth of preparation they're like just do it i'm like okay and at the end they were like that was so awesome this was the best session ever and I'm thinking, it can't be. No, that's <laughs> that's not correct. Like, there's no way you had more fun with me having no plan than all the times I did all this work. Mm -hmm. And and really, my whole life has been about trying to figure out how these two things can be compatible. Like, how can you do great preparation, uh, do all this good work, and also the truth, the fact that it's it's so much better when you just riff off the players and the. the the beauty is trying to combine those. So when I try to do a project uh, and publishing is totally different than just running your own home group. But when I'm trying to do a project, I try to create projects that are more open so that you get both those experiences. And same thing in my home campaign, if I'm creating uh, for just for my, my friends to play, I try to think of it more as an outline that is a loose concept of what might happen uh, but the better games are ones that are going to allow the players to come up with wacky ideas and take you in any direction. And, and it's totally okay that what you prepared, it doesn't get used. Like, that's totally fine. You can also always use it later. Yeah. I've learned that as well. Like, you guys didn't go in this room. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, we're going to put this in this building now. Yeah. Like, hey, that's a big thing. If you spend some time on something really cool and you love it, you just don't do it, save it. It's It's yeah. cool. <laughs> Those were great answers. Um, that was cool to hear the different perspectives uh, mm -hmm. about hex crawl, organic, structured. Um, I've played as a player in both modules and hex crawl, and it's it's interesting how different the feelings are of both of those. Mm -hmm. um, another question I had that I that I've observed as a club advisor. Um, among my students is sometimes there are 
different philosophies or perspectives or levels of seriousness within a play group. And I was wondering how you, how you effectively moderate that and how, like, if there's any tips on like, if you, if you see this happening, this is something you need to deal with this way. Or if you see this, like, are there common issues within a play group that a DM can kind of field and keep the play group together versus saying like, well, this person's not really our, our type. They're not at our table anymore. Mm -hmm. You want to take it, Chris? <laughs> um, like, uh, yeah, well, like, thinking back, like, in dealing with young people and, like, thinking back, like, things that were total blind spots for me as a young person playing the game, um, it's much more effective to let players kind of sort out among themselves about the type of game they want to have because the more the DM... Like there's been some say so the DM shows throws in grudge monsters like you're screwing with my world and here's this Umberhold now are you happy and then <laughs> yeah. it's just kind of devolves from there but um you know in terms of that's part of why there's session zero you want to talk and it has like you know I really don't want to have this like a slap and giggles and be like murder hobos twenty four seven you kind of lay that out ahead of time that like the type of game you want and an ongoing basis. But then at the same time, if the person wants to play a certain way, then the person wants to play a certain way and you kind of give that to them and you kind of like reinforce about how the world works if they're going to be that way. So if you have like a person who's always like throwing levers, which is like never goes away. There's people I still play with today are like yeah. stirrers of stuff and lever throwers and they just can't stop. They just like, you know, they're totally mature individuals. They're just like, you know, functioning human beings and they just can't stop like setting things on fire 24 seven. And so right. it doesn't go away the ways that you deal with it as like a play group has variations and there's lots of things that you can do before. It's like, Oh, you can't play with this anymore. It's just like, you know, you just kind of let them on. Like maybe it shouldn't be a good that you're starting a fight and we're all going to die because you just can't stop telling this joke, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I guess moderate, let them do it and let the play happen like along the way as they just kind of like have this circumstance. Maybe I'm totally reading into this because this what struck me instantaneously. Like, you know, the lever puller is just not taking anything seriously. Yeah. It's a beautifully crafted encounter I have and they're just like hitting on the barmaid or like, I don't know, <laughs> painting things red. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but let them do it because it's their freedom of choice. It's like they want to play. That's a legit matter of play. But like, you know, the negotiating whether you as a play group can't take that or can't negotiate together is not something to be resolved with dice or just mechanics of the game. Sometimes you gotta step back and say, hey, wait, this is not the game I want to run. So mm -hmm. it's hard. It's always hard. And it doesn't get easier. It just more the more adult talking you to you do and don't like send grudge monsters, the better off you'll be. So <laughs> Yeah, I mean I myself never had to like get rid of somebody there's you know a player that i don't like particularly love there's a dm i think that is in our group that i don't like love playing with because <laughs> the whole time i'm like i could just be doing this so much better oh my god um <laughs> as far as as far as like the uh the the issues within the party though uh mr keller that you asked about yeah um I i'll pop on chris's thing like let let them kind of do their thing again you are creating an experience they are living in the experience so if they're having a great time just like fart joking it up just go with it man it's fun if you're laughing your butt off it's it's that's why we're having a community game session we're spending four hours having a great time that's cool and then just next time when you're playing plan some simpler things um but yeah i've never had to deal with like a problem player there's a session i'm in now that i really don't like just like the attitude of this one person. And I, as a player, we're players together, have been kind of working on him and like helping him become a, like a better, more respectful, more like fun player. And he's he's like really being like, thanks guys, thanks. Now, instead of like, I smash it with an ax. No, I don't want to play Unless whole campaign, smash it with an ax. It's not fun, but he's also kind of new. So be, uh, be patient and be respectful and as a, if, if, if you're in a group and you're a player and someone else is a player and this other player is bugging you, um, I wouldn't go to the GM. Don't go to the DM for it. They've got enough fun. They don't want to hear it. I mean, I, I'm a chef of a restaurant. I hear 
all the issues. <laughs> I'd rather you two resolve it than me have to be like, really, guys? So um, if you're a player with a problem with another player, like, have a chat. It's chill, man. Be like, hey, let's uh, talk about, like, hey, let, let's, like, in the next session, let's do, like, a cool, like, maneuver where you use my advantage on a flanking and, like, we'll, like, make it cool. Like, if you want to work it, like, work with that player instead of being like, I hate yeah. that guy's gameplay and then not agree during the game. Now, the session zero thing is a big deal. There's definitely different ways to play a whole campaign, and that's fun. So, yeah, I think just, like, just talk to them. It's fine. I would also say that you have legitimate reasons why players want entirely different things out of the experience. You know, mm -hmm. people are different, and you're going to have some players that are the instigator lever pullers, like you're talking about. You're going to have some players who are like, I have made the build that kills everything and is self sufficient, and I don't need the other five people at this table. <laughs> oh, the uh, and they're, they're right, the they're power there. gamer. Uh, you're going to have the person who is, and now I would like to engage in a half hour dramatic sequence with this non player character the DM presented, right? And all by myself, it is, it is drama time. Those are all, they come from legitimate places of what we like as players. And any one of us is going to like one or more of these areas of play more than others. Um, oh, the other type you have is someone who just wants to quietly observe, right, is one that you'll see a lot. Um, the leader that wants to be strategy, right? There are all these kinds of types. And so part of the, I, I think it's the fun of being a, a GM is to try to balance out these, these personalities at the table. It's a little harder when you're younger. Um, because we're, we're not so used to trying to do that later when, when you've all been like in the job world for longer, you kind of get used to doing that in your life, which translates to it being easier at the table as well. Um, cause you've got, you have to, you have to do it, you know, during your work hours. Um, but you know, what I find is, is just realizing if you come at it from the perspective that everybody's got a, a right to be at the table and they've got a reason why they like the things they want. Then it's just about trying to find where you can uh, prevent those overlapping interests from being painful. And one thing I do, because instigators do come up a lot, because they, they tend to just override everybody. You know, I murder the person we're talking to, um, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and and there are plenty of adults that way, as we said. But uh, so one thing I do as a as a GM is I have a rule that anything you tell me you do is a thing you initiate doing, but isn't necessarily gonna get resolved. So if you tell me that you murder the captive, uh, there are many reasons why people, people can object to that. Um, and so I'm gonna say, so everybody sees this character begin to do this, what do the rest of you think about this? Cool, right? And I'm gonna let the table decide how that plays out. And just because you shouted it out first does not mean it happens, right? And that can be for any situation, right? I'm gonna just, uh, you know, run right into the room when everybody's clearly, the rest of the party's planning a, a cautious strategy. You know, you can have that discussion and say, no, I'd really like to stop them. And it's an opportunity for all of us to work through what we really want that outcome to be like. And that kind of approach I find tends to defuse some of these situations over time. If need be, you sit down a hard rule and say, hey, any player can do the following. And maybe it's like, I can say I didn't like that, right? So an X card type thing, which is a technique where you have cards with X's on them. And you can put it out and say, I'm not comfortable with this topic or this situation, or I want us to pause. You know, you can, you can put in harder rules like that too to kind of um, prevent things from getting out of hand if it's getting to a point where you find yourself having arguments and so on. And kids, uh, what Tess just said is a huge deal at Orcs events for us. Uh, we had to, it's not HR, but we had to write a whole kind of contract for our new DMs. They need to kind of follow rules of um, social okay, I'm not okay with that. And there's a certain amount of um, being conscious of everyone. These are a table of six strangers. If someone's got a problem with something or it really triggers them or it really makes them uncomfortable, but they are too afraid to speak up, there's a nonverbal way to say, red flag or yellow card kind of thing. Um, and it, that that's something that uh, if any of you guys want to look up more, there's some pretty simple pieces um, in the D&D community about how to keep everyone not offended with the game and other players going on. And I think it's very, it's very, it's more important now than ever has been in gaming because D&D is not just a bunch of neckbeard men, like kicking kick it white boy style. 
it is so much more inclusive that these rules need to be addressed before we continue making D&D like the most successful thing ever that we love. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. It, it's to, thank you. Like that's a very. Yeah. I'm sure Ack Inc had a lot to talk. Like that is some serious Watsy stuff. The inclusiveness and the and the like the X card, um, that kind of stuff's very important now, and we all need to respect it because yeah. it is 2020 gaming. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think if if you're all there to have fun in a community, if one person is having fun at the expense of other people, that's other people not having fun. And I think that's important to remember is mm. yeah. The respect so, right. thing, yeah. So we are kind of close heading to the end of this. Um, and I can I can pause my question if a student wants to put in a question mark. But I was thinking that maybe a, a final takeaway thing is um, as a DM in your past, have there been things that you did? Oh, there you go. Never mind. Josh, you're up. Um, sorry to cut you no, off. No, no, this is, this is yeah. time for you. Um, I was just wondering, I've had experience in campaigns that I've played in as a player and campaigns that I've DM'd with, um, people who play who are very quiet and don't really participate, but they just kind of get pushed along the whole way. And how can I involve those people more? as a DM the, player. Killer. killer. The, the, the first thing I would ask them is, are you having fun? Because if they are totally happy, then that's kind of really what they want to give you and what they want out of it. There are some people who really just want to be sort of backseat observers. And, you know, they are, they're not looking to be heavily involved. And if we try to push them or prompt them too much, we actually erode their enjoyment of the game. So I think that's the first thing, right? If you reach out to them and they say, yeah, I don't know how to get involved, then you can help them get involved. But if, they, if they're totally happy, then that's just kind of who they are. What are the, because Orcs is such like a, uh, a monthly thing without, where the DMs don't know who they're playing with, or sometimes they do, but one of the most impressive things I've seen for, from, my, from my group and myself included is, if they're like what Ted is saying, like they just kind of don't know how to start. Uh, if you can kind of create a scenario that highlights their character's skill set, really use that 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 your your skills and, and abilities. Forget the attack stuff. Forget the spell stuff. If you're like you're in a scenario where you happen to be proficient in history or religion, and they're the highlight of the next fifteen minutes. That's a big icebreaker, and it's one of my favorite things to do, and one of the best, best ways to do it. I've learned this from one of my DMs and close friend, Law Johnson. Use the old school fourth edition style um, skill check. You don't need to have every encounter be in a, uh, a battle. It's actually pretty boring. So uh, you just pull the treasure out of the chest, and the entire temple starts shaking under you. It's starting to come down. You'd have six rounds of play to get from point A to point B. And you kind of uh, narrate, oh, the wall starts breaking over here. Teos, you're up like, I'm gonna use my uh, acrobatics to jump over this boulder and show you guys the way through. Like, cool, and then you roll, and it's a success or fail. It's called a skill check, or sorry, skill challenge. And it's a great encounter that goes from every person, and they can't use their, they can use weapons and, and their magic, fine. But they really wanna use their cool skill abilities and they narrate something like, I'm gonna use perception to see if I can figure out the best route around all the traps that we look through already. Like, I'm gonna to try to, uh, okay, cool, roll perception. And it, uh, you know, uh, 11 or above success, 10, like you, or you put a DC on it. But a skill challenge is cool because it's it really highlights that stuff where you're not really using all your character sheet. And if someone's quiet and they really, like, they don't have much attacks going on, they might be killer at religion. And they'll be like, I can, like think about all the I, I can use religion in some you know creative form to get us a, a, a success instead of like I only have a dagger I can't do much in combat. Four challenge a cool way to get someone out of their shell with the rest of their character sheet. 
Yeah, I would kind of agree that um, there are some people who just like being there at the table. And like, you know, if you don't know them, you might not know that they just like doing it, even though they're not speaking. Um, and that just like experience to read the table and know the people there. Sometimes you the, like people just don't know. I think a fair thing to do is because there's table talkers who just don't stop and like they will they will like roll over other people. And it's kind of like the game master's somewhat responsibility to make sure that you give people the opportunity to, to speak because some people are just like talking and then more some of the more quiet people just won't want to interrupt or won't mm -hmm. want to shake, shake the boat. So use a GM um, trying to give equal ask time. And I don't mean like, you no know, spotlight time, just ask times like so-and-so is doing this, so-and-so is going to do this. What are you going to do right now while we're doing this? And then it just kind of puts them on the spot and they can just say, well, I just do this, something really simple, or they can expand out to something wider. But like, as long as you're like, you know, passing the mic as it were to that person, uh, on equal terms with everyone else, then they always have the opportunity to do something. And so um, that's not really putting them on the spot or forcing them to do anything. It just gives them the opportunity on an ongoing basis, even though they might be a quiet person at the table. So it is, I do think it is the job of the DM slash GM to move the mic around the table on an ongoing yeah. basis. Cause there are people who just will like, just make it all about them. Not because cause they're having a blast. So. That's another another thing you can do with with is use non-player characters as your GM voice. So if there's mm -hmm. like a guide that's coming along with the party, right? The guide can turn to that quiet player and say, "What do you think we should do?" Right? And if you keep in mind like what, you know, you were saying about skills, you can keep in mind what are their good skills or what's their class, what's their what are their capabilities? And so the NPCs can turn to those capabilities. You're the ranger, you know, do you think it's going to rain? And the player might go, I don't, I don't know. Do I know? Yeah, make me, you know, a wilderness check, make me a whatever, right? And, and yeah, you think it's going to rain, right? And then they look cool. Um, and so you can facilitate yeah. that through the NPCs. Yeah, I mean, if the issue is like someone's like um, too shy to interact, one of the coolest things about role-playing games in general and D&D for sure is the character they have is super cool on their sheet. Let them open up through that character stuff. If, uh, if I'm a shy person, but I've got a barbarian that's gregarious, I do want to play that. I might be like a little afraid to get in there, but once I start using my, my cool barbarian stuff, I get into my barbarian. That's one of the best things about D&D &D and role playing is you don't have to, you're not supposed to be you in this game, unless you want to be, but it's cool to be a different person. And that really opens up people. And we've seen this in orcs for over two years. People have just like, have this fresh and they can like interact with like oh, I'm just like learning social skills through this character. They just need a little like nudge or like, you know, a word that says, you know, uh, a charisma check and like, oh, we're pretty smart. And it's like, yeah, you made it cool. And like, oh, oh great. I can do more of those, right? And, like you can do them all day long. It really helps. That's a very good thing, especially with all like you guys as students stuff. Like that's a huge thing. It's one of the cooler parts about doing period. And it makes a great game session. We have like one last, we have an ongoing thing like across the games that like a number one way of get someone to describe or talk or do something is like if they defeat a monster or defeat something, it's like, okay, you've defeated this person. How did you do it? Yeah. And then you put them on the spot. It's like, you know, how did you slay this? How did you defeat them? And then like no one's going to say, oh, they just fell over. They, they, it kind of puts them on the spot in a really like generous way. It's like, you're a great hero. Explain how. And then they, it kind of, puts them on the spot a little bit like don't push on but it's really great like you'd be surprised how many people just leap up and describe how they viciously like you know did this, that, 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 that. yeah yeah and, people and love that people love describing the little details about how they're victorious so and that and that pops in what Taylor said about like i think about it like a movie scene like hell yeah like that is fun we could describe things all day long if it's like especially if you just did something cool and the table's like yay like tell me how you took the ogre down like oh man got, like when i was on his back just like you know like it's so much fun to like put yeah. that, that that mind uh picture into people's heads along those lines another trick i like to use is that of the uh 80s montage from a television show. <laughs> so if you look up a television show like The A-Team or any of those kind of era of old TV shows, don't watch them for long because they're all terrible by today's standards. But if you just watch the beginning, there'll be a theme song playing and then they'll show like five seconds of this character that's like an iconic look at the character, right? And then it'll like flash their name at the bottom in cheesy lettering. 
And that's the effect I'm going for. And so a lot of times I'll do it with character introductions at convention tables, but I'll also do this in home games too. And I'll even do it as flashbacks through NPCs. So like I say, like, you know, the, the old sage that you come to see says, you know, why should I help you? And he says, tell me about one time when you really dug deep and you gave it your all. And then I say, okay, we're going into an 80s movie flashback and I'll explain everything I, I just finished saying to you guys. And I'll say, all right, you know, what was your character doing in this awesome give it your all moment? Pretend there's a theme song going. You can even tell me the theme song if you want, but paint this picture for you, like set the movie scene for me. And a lot of times characters can get into that and it can draw them out. Even if they're fairly shy, they'll, they'll give you this visual that, you know, that they're seeing of their character and that can be helpful. That's great, Taylor. That's awesome. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Hilarious. And then her sweet name pops up in like 3D lettering. Yeah. Like, yeah. like like the, the, yeah. the show, uh, uh, if, you got, if anyone watched uh, Hunters on, um, oh, is that Netflix? Uh, it, it's it's cool. And there's like the, the second episode just like introduces these characters and it's total pulp comic, like boom, their name. And like, <laughs> like, like you're like, hell yeah, I'm like pumped. <laughs> Comic book yeah. style. It's great. Excitement. Yeah. <laughs> All right, students. Um, we are getting close to time to end this session. Does anyone have any other questions? All right, I'll start that question I had before and feel yeah, free to end one more. Hell yeah. Um, and since we're at like uh, like eight or ten minutes um, before the next one starts, um, what is one thing? that either just you used to do it as a DM and you wish you'd never done that, or it's just something that makes you cringe every time and like people just need to stop doing this when we're playing. I mean, mine's really easy. We were already talking about it, like um, doing the perfect, like, you know, I am the DM and you wrecked my story and being like really upset over like, you know, players having agency is what it's called. Like, you know, the players having a say in how the story goes. And so all that type of sentimentality of me doing that as a young person, it's like, yeah, that that was unnecessary. You know, there's one thing that I still suck at. How about that? That I'm not good at. Boss battles are one thing. I'm just surprised how poorly I play a, a bad guy with so much cool stuff that I get so into my players is cool things they're doing that I'll kind of like not do a good job on my own monster turn. I will just be like, uh, I do this and this. But, and then I'll look back and I'm like, I've got multi-attack. I could have done that as a, but like, I will not <laughs> play my, my bad guy well at all. Cause I'm way more into my player experience than my bad guy trying to kill them. I just not, I gotta get better. That's one thing I just suck at like really crushing them. Like I should be doing this and I've got oh, the whole thing. I thought about it and I just forget about advantage against this. I forget about resistances. I, like, I'll, I'll blank on all the cool stuff that Wizard of the Coast built for this awesome monster. <laughs> like, basically half past my turn just to get to the next player's cool idea. So that's something I do completely wrong all the time. My players love it. <laughs> so, so I think that one thing that that I've tried to improve over the years, and, and I really did not do well when I was a younger player or a GM, is that I thought that it should constantly be testing the players. And it's a little bit like the the idea of you know hitting them too hard, but it's just that idea. You think that the the, the characters and players must always be tested to have a good time when actually players have an awesome time just destroying stuff. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> it's a game, right? Hell yeah. Right, right. They love to win. And, and it's funny because when I play, I love to win. And so I should know better. But but that's a thing that often, like, I, I'm a tactical person in my brain. And so, like, I want to create these tough, challenging encounters. And that is good to have some of those. But I keep telling myself that, you know, just have some really easy wins, you know, where they just mow through some foes or they figure out the easy puzzle. And because there really is nothing worse, especially puzzles. Like if you give a puzzle that nobody can solve, <laughs> that it's is so the most pain, how to have a painful Torch. half hour, right? Like just everybody just sits there going like, what? but you'll see it if you put, if you make an easy puzzle, 
and people solve it quickly, they have the biggest smile on their face, right? Mm -hmm. About how smart they are because they are, right? Like that's awesome. And, and that's the kind of thing that I try to remind myself because it's a weakness of mine to try to make it too challenging. Yeah. It's all about like making things easier than you think it should be is a common yeah. thing. Like, especially when you're like providing descriptions, frequently my, like, you know, my adventures will be like chock full of little story details, but by the time it filters over to the player's understanding of it, it just like, <laughs> Chris, what are you doing? Like no one, cares understands about this thing that totally links up to this big story or yeah. not so being obvious being obvious being easy like yeah. um it's the same advice for teachers like be obvious be easy and ki kids aren't going to remember the one time when things weren't totally structured just right so be obvious be easy be be it so people can see and just be there and do jiggle the levers and have fun yeah awesome all right, so one last thing with it. You guys, we've been mentioning levers so much. I want to show you something <laughs> that, that's pretty cool. So I assume we all know who Mr. Chris Perkins is. Um, I know him from, uh, I've done Level Leader in Portland two years in a row. I uh, I organize the orcs part of it because they need DMs. Level Leader is a big, like, it's a giant version of orcs. It's one night only. Uh, Chris Funk from the Decemberist uh, puts it in his studio. And I, I get to cook the dinner for all the, the, the fancy tables. And I brought him one of the first modules he ever wrote. It's really weird. Blaslin's Black Spear and his little signature quote in there. Try all the doors, pull all the levers, and, and drink that potion. <laughs> I think it's pretty important to do as a player. No, never, never be afraid to pull the lever, open the door, and drink that potion, Chris Perkin. When That's I had great. Chris, I got something for you to say. He's like, holy shit, I've never seen this. He published this when he was a history teacher in the Midwest when he was it, when he was still a teacher. So for you teachers out there, <laughs> Chris dare, is someday. Dare to dream. Yeah, right? <laughs> and this is in Dragon Magazine, but I just heard lever eight times. Like, I just was looking at the thing I, I put up. So, awesome. yeah, always pull the lever, guys. Go for it. Some players got to do it. <laughs> Awesome. And I think that's all the time we have for this session. Thank you all. And students, thank you for coming and asking your questions. It was awesome to get to have this time with these great DMs.